This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recording on August 20th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are recording in Stockholm, Sweden. We're at the Karolinska Institute. Now, I've learned from this trip so far that there are several campuses of the Karolinska, and we are at the Houdinge campus. And everything I pronounce today will probably be wrong. And so I'm going to have my guests correct me. And so let me introduce my guests. I have three uh, professors from the Karolinska to join me and talk about their work today. Uh, on my left, Professor Ali Mirazimi. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. And that's a good pronunciation. Very good. It's because it's not a Swedish name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to, pro to pronounce. Welcome. And uh, to his left, uh, Niklas Bjorkstrom. Yes. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you very much. Is that a good way to say it? It's, it's a good way for English speakers. I guess the Swedish would one say it? Say would it? be no. Niklas Bjorkström. We have no. these two special letters, the O's with two dots on top. Okay, so you have very special ways of saying things that would take me a long time to, to practice. Anyway, welcome to TWIV. And finally, Mati Salberg. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Now, Thank you. please pronounce uh, your name as you do. Yeah, uh, Matti Selberg. It's a mix between Swedish and Finnish. Really? Yeah. Mm. Salberg. Salberg. <laughs> Selberg. So the G is very soft. Uh, Salberg, yeah, it is. Selberg. It's more a G than a G. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, you heard it from them. Yeah. And... Uh, my name is Rack and Yellow, and many people mispronounce it, but it's okay. I tell them, just remember, Black and Yellow for my name. Black and Yellow. Rack and Yellow, Black and Yellow. So we're going to talk a little bit about your science, but first I want to find out a little bit about your history, where you were from and educated and so forth. So let's start with you. You're not from Sweden. No, I'm not. I'm born in Iran, moved to Sweden in the early 80s. Uh -huh. Then I did my... Uh, graduate stu study in Karolinska, and then I get my PhD in Karolinska, and follow up was Karolinska. So, but now I'm working in public health agency of Sweden and also National Veterinary Institute. Okay. So, how old again were you when you came from? Iran? I was. Uh, oh, that's very tough to ca calculate now. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I was 18. So you'd already gone to high school. I did my high school in Iran, and at that point. Were you already interested in science? Yes, I believe so. That's I, it's long time ago, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yeah. memory week. Yes. Yeah. So you came to Sweden, and then you went to to college. I did. Uh, I, I yes, I did the college. I mean, the first is the language step, and then yeah. is college, and then study university, and so on. So you had to learn Swedish. Yes, that was the Although they, everyone is speaking English here too. Yes, they do, they do. But Did if you, you know want it? to live in a place, you need to have yeah, language. Of course. And the university is in Swedish? Um, yeah, in the, some programs. In, nowadays, it depends on, the, the, depends on the programs. But at that time, it was Swedish, yes. Okay. And then you, in the university, you majored in science? Yes, in science. It's in medical science. Mm -hmm. And then follow up in the microbiology. And then PhD in virology. And then... So on, so on. Did you do a postdoc? I did a post, a very short postdoc, uh, also in Karolinska. I just changed the team. Okay. So it was very short, but then I get a quite uh, uh, good position. At that time, was uh, Swedish CDC. Mm -hmm. uh, they started this new BCL4 laboratory. So I come as a junior scientist, and then since then I have been in that lab. Okay. So you never left Sweden. I never left Sweden. <laughs> That's true. It's interesting. Many people leave and go work somewhere else, often in the U.S., but you've always stayed here. Yes. It's quite interesting. Okay. Um, we'll come back and we'll talk yeah. about your science. So, Nicholas, you're from Sweden, I would presume. Right? I'm from Sweden, from the southern part of Sweden, uh -huh. uh, from an old city called uh, Kalmar. It has a beautiful castle. 
and I trained at the Karolinska, so I did my MD degree here, and I also did my PhD here at the Karolinska. Um, during my PhD, I spent some time at uh, Rockefeller with uh, in the lab of uh, Charlie Rice. Oh yeah, sure. Um, and then I did a postdoc at the NIH at the Vaccine Research Center mm -hmm. with uh, Richard Kalp, and then came back here in 2014 and set up my own lab. Um, and we are immunologists, but doing a lot of immunovirology. Right. And in parallel, I'm also pursuing a medical um, career. So I'm right now training in uh, clinical microbiology. And I'm sort of sharing my time 50-50 between the clinics and heading my research team. So you see patients? In clinical micro, we don't see patients in, in Sweden. We are more lab-based and uh, we, we do all the clinical diagnostics of, for viruses, bacteria and parasites. All right. So in the, in the U.S., it's similar. There are clinical laboratories and hospitals where MDs are working and they help to interpret the, the findings of the laboratory, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this morning, for instance, I was in the clinics and I did diagnostics of deep abdominal abscesses and different types of bacteria you yeah. find in there. And so you would like to do 50% there and 50% in the laboratory doing research, right? I think maybe down the road, 50-50 is not really feasible. So I want yeah. to finish my training and then to maybe have most of my time dedicated to research, yeah. let's say 80%, and then to have sort of a clinical, small clinical track on the side yeah. being niche towards something. I recently visited the clinical lab at Columbia University, and I was amazed at how it's changed. I hadn't been in one for 30 years. Mm -hmm. It's just remarkable, yeah, right, highly, the technology. Yeah, highly automated, and now it's uh, NGS coming on all fronts very rapidly. Yeah. And I think diagnostics in five years will look very different compared to today. You must have a uh, Malditoff machine, right? Yeah, yeah. No, we have Where several. You, and you can spot colonies, and in 20 minutes you know exactly. This is amazing. It's revolutionizing. Yeah. So do you remember w when you were interested in medicine? In how early in your life? I think it wasn't really medicine. I think when I went to high school, I actually almost failed biology. And that was <laughs> more because biology back then was all about memorizing things. Uh, and I didn't think that was really interesting. I was more into asking, so why is that happening? And, yeah. and so on. And so I guess I knew that I wanted to do science. And then I figured that becoming an MD is a good platform for doing science. But also then during my MD training, I sort of also found out that I enjoyed the sort of clinical part of it. Okay. Matti, where are you from? Uh, I'm uh, Swedish, but I'm uh, half Finnish. My mother is from Finland. She came after the war. And uh, so I'm born in Sweden. I've lived most of my life in Stockholm. And uh, I, uh, well, I did my, uh, I'm a dentist. My training. Uh -huh. So I'm a doctor of dental surgery and I got my, uh, did my uh, dental uh, or education here at KI in parallel with doing a PhD. So I got the dental degree and a PhD in 91. Then I went to uh, Scripps, worked with David Millich, uh, who used to be with the Frank Chisar lab. Uh, in La Jolla, La Jolla. La Jolla. Yeah. beautiful isn't it oh yeah it is it's perfect weather <laughs> you, but you kind of if you're a Swede you kind of uh, uh, miss the cold <laughs> the nice cold fresh air because it's always perfect weather in La Jolla but it's beautiful and it's, uh, it's a great place uh, Scripps is a great place to be so then I uh, came back, I did uh, work part-time as a dentist, and then I uh, became a professor in 2000. So uh, then I skipped dentistry. So I've been working as a, doing research, and now since, uh, what is it, nine years, I'm head of the department of laboratory medicine. Okay. And you remember when you got interested in science, how early in your life? It was in high school, I think. I did actually a, uh, what's called in uh, Swedish, it's called uh, C or E or so. I, it, it's basically you go somewhere and do your practice. Yeah. So I went to one of the labs at KI and uh, it was neuroscience and 
they had uh, little brains, rat brains. Uh -huh. So I said, can I have one of those brains? <laughs> and then <laughs> the technician, she took the rat, chopped off the head, pulled out the, the, uh, the brain and said, here you go. Wow. So, uh, but st that wasn't what, what got me interested, but it was the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the science in that lab, really, that uh, uh, got me interested in science. So that, that, I think that was the spark, actually. So that's probably not allowed today to... Uh, well, the, I, she was anyway going to sacrifice it, but uh, no, I yeah. probably couldn't do that today. Uh, things change, you know. Yeah. When I was in science first, no one wore gloves in the lab. Yeah. And there was no animal... In the U.S., we have animal committees. You have to run, make protocols and so forth. There was none of that, so everything has changed. So um, the Karolinsk Institute, many people, of course, throughout the world recognize the name. It's, really, it's a university, right? Yeah, it's a university. Even though it's called an institute, it's really a university. Yeah, even though the institute, it's actually in the name that it's called Karolinska Institute, so it, but it's not an institute. It's truly a university. So you have undergraduate students? Yeah, and undergraduate. PhD and PhD and everything. Yeah, okay. everything. Medical school as well? Yeah, we have, uh, I think we have around 17 different uh, undergraduate programs. So it's uh, medicine, dentistry, uh, technicians, nurses, uh, pretty much, but everything, it's, it's a focused medical university. And there are, so we are on the Houdinga campus, there's Solna, right? Mm. And there's, are there others as well? Uh, well it, it's, they, you have the, the three big campuses are the Solna uh, campus, which is preclinical mainly. Then you have the uh, uh, Karolinska or, or KI campus North, which is uh, the hospital together with Danderyds hospital. And then you have the uh, campus south, which is here in Flemingsberg, Huddinge, okay. which is Huddinge. this and the south hospital. So it's basically three campuses. Okay. But then it's teaching activities on All many over. other hospitals and yeah. primary care centers and so on throughout the Stockholm uh, county or so, the Stockholm region. Do you know how many people are... In all of the Karolinskas, how many people are involved? Students, faculty, everything? I think employees, it's, it's around uh, four or five thousand, and then it's another four or five thousand students. So it's maybe ten thousand in total, I think. So I'm amazed this country is big. Ten, there are just ten million people. Yeah. And so a million in Stockholm, right? Uh, two. Two, two, two million. Mm -hmm. And you know, 10 million is less than the population of New York City, where you spent yeah, some time, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, so I'm amazed. And my view of Stockholm, Sweden from afar, and also here is that everything is nice and clean and orderly, and it all works. And uh, it seems to be fulfilling my, my long view so I think, far. I think that definitely helps that it's yeah. not, I mean, overcrowded here. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, that, that's uh, the, the organizational skill of Swedes. I mean, we, we are extremely organized and that everybody had a per, has a personal number, which makes epidemiology. This is the dream country for that's right. epidemiology. That's right. So I, the reason I'm here is to go to the meeting in Smögen. Is that how you would say it? Correct. Smögen. Smögen. And uh, Erling Norby told me last night that you can vaccinate 92% of everybody in Sweden. And mm. this is amazing. This is the only country where they eradicated polio with the inactivated polio mm. vaccine. Yeah. And Albert Sabin said you could never eradicate mm. polio with that vaccine, but here yeah. you, you proved it otherwise. So, and then you said everyone has a number so you can do great tracking. Right? Yeah, exactly. This is amazing, we, yeah. great stuff. Mm. Okay, so this is my first trip here to Sweden, I've been to Finland twice mm -hmm. for meetings. I've never been here. And I'm, to I'm going to uh, Denmark in September. And then uh, I've never been to Norway. So if anyone is listening who wants to invite me to Norway, I would love to go. <laughs> they have virology in Norway. Oh, they have. <laughs> Excellent virologist. So let's start with you, Ali. Um, so you're, you run the BSL-4 here, right? Yes. So many years ago, we visited the BSL-4 in Boston, 
which is called The Needle, you know? You've heard of it, probably. Yes. And we made a, a documentary, because mm -hmm. it wasn't open yet. No. And we got to go in and put on suits and go through and tour it. It's really, really quite remarkable. So you have one, where it's in um, Solna, right? It is in the campus Solna, but belong to the public health agency of Sweden. Okay. And is that the only one, the BSO4 in Sweden? It's the only one in the North Europe, I would ah. say. So this is the only one. I mean, the closest one is will be in Germany. Right. So, yeah. so Norway doesn't have one, Finland, no. Denmark, Denmark, no. The UK has some though, right? The UK has one. Yes. And, but there are plenty of BSL-3 facilities here. In, we have plenty of in Sweden. Uh, yeah. BCL3, okay. yes. So I wanted to talk to you about a virus we have not discussed on TWIV, Cong Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. So let's talk a little bit about what it is and, and uh, what you're doing. So what kind of virus is that? It's belonged to the viral hemorrhagic fever. So the most famous of them is the Ebola virus. Uh, so, but this is as name of the virus saying Crimea and Congo. So, so the virus actually been um, founded in, in 1944 in Crimea. Mm -hmm. At that time they couldn't isolate the virus. So they call it uh, Crimean hemorrhagic tick-borne disease. And then later on in the 50s, they could isolate this virus in the Congo. So they call it Congo hemorrhagic fever and take additional 10 years before they found that it was the same virus and then discussion how to call the virus it become Crimean Congo. So this is hemorrhagic. Uh, uh, this is actually is more hemorrhagic compared to the other viruses we call hemorrhagic as Ebola Lassa. So this is really hemorrhagic fever. Mm -hmm. I was just in a, a workshop in Turkey in July, June, July. It was really amazing because we meet several patients and this is really hemorrhagic. When you see the patients, it's really, it's really tough disease. Mm. Uh, so, and it belong to the selected agent, as you call it in US. So it's PCL4 laboratory and we have the virus from the Southern East Asia to even Western Europe such as we have two cases in two different years in Spain. So we know that the virus is also in Spain and the Eastern Europe is highly affected. So you, so you have to work on it in a BSL-4. Exactly. Unless you just are working with glycoproteins and you can do it outside of the laboratory. Sure. So um, what, what's the fatality rate compared to, say, Ebola? Yeah, this... We, we're saying around 5 to 30 percent, depend on uh, which country you, you, you study. So, Turkish uh, uh, stating that it is about 5 percent, and they are the one who has most of the cases. Turkey. Turkey, yeah. Okay. So, so it is about 1,000 cases yearly, so they have about 5 percent. But if you go to South Africa or even the Kosovo in Europe, yeah. they are stating that the mortality is close to the 30 percent. So this is, we are not clear that what is the resp I mean, what is really the reason that this big difference between 5 and 30? It could depend on the better public health in Turkey, so they even uh, detect the non-symptomatic or mild uh, symptomatic disease. Yeah. But in Kosovo, Africa, they might, may just look for the severe cases, why the 30% mortality. So, uh, does it, it, with Ebola, we're used to epidemics, right? It's quiet for a while, then there's an outbreak. Is this the same pattern with CCH? No, I, I will say it, it's not really epidemic. I will say it's more as, as a cluster. Okay. So it's come affecting a spot and then it's gone and until next year. This is tick-borne disease, so it's follow the tick uh, okay. biology. So when the tick start to move, and then we see the peak of the disease. So like, is it like Ebola in that uh, it's transmitted by healthcare? facilities as well among, and among families taking care of each other? Uh, it, it is. Um, there are several studies showing that we see the nosocomial diseases yeah. in hospitals and even between, but not as bad as we find for Ebola. Okay. So what's the total number of infections a year globally? Oh, globally, I don't believe it's more than two, three thousand. Okay. And it's about less than 30% fatality, you would say. Uh, in, the, in the worst case scenario. But this, there's clearly a medical need for interventions, you would say, right? Yeah, I will say because, I mean, the, the, the degree of disease, even those who never uh, uh, die, yeah. they really suffer of the disease. Okay. So this is really, it's not, a, it's very bad disease. So, so I will say we need vaccine, we need antivirus. You know, it's, this whole idea of medical need is very interesting. 
uh, we work on a virus, enterovirus 68. And, you know, in the U.S., maybe there have been 500 cases of paralytic disease. And I wrote a grant proposal to look for antivirals, and they said it wasn't enough of a medical need. So mm -hmm. I said, why don't you tell these 500 yeah. people, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I exactly. think if you have 10 people, it's probably enough, right? Yeah. So the, the virus is spread by ticks, you said, yes. right? And they, they must get it from some other animal reservoir, non-human? Uh, th that's really quite unknown. Uh, we believe that uh, even vec um, ticks, not only the vector, maybe also the host. I see. So, so and these ticks are, um, can live one, two years. So mm -hmm. they can, and then by co feeding, they can transmit to the new ticks I and see. also uh, tra translationally through the tick to the eggs. Okay. And we believe big animals and even small rodents are some kind of amplifier. So, so they increase the number of the virus okay. and transmit to the new ticks. So uh, what about, I, I mean, I read somewhere that livestock may also be involved in amplifying. Is that right? Yes, it is. I mean, livestock is, is quite amplifier of the yeah, disease. Yeah. Uh, they don't get the disease. They never show the symptoms. Mm -hmm. It's only human who show the symptoms. Why? Why we don't know the number of the animals affected. So when they go in the endemic area and look for the seroprevalence of yeah. animals, they yeah. found up to 70, 80 percent. So it's really huge in the, in the endemic area. And the ticks, are, when they're infected, they're fine as far as we no, can. They, yeah, it seems as so. Far as <laughs> it seems can, so, yeah. Although, <laughs> they are happy. <laughs> who knows what a tick is feeling, right? Yes. And you said there were some cases in Spain? Yes, there has been uh, one last year and one 2016. Oh, these are not imported though, right? No, these are really uh, from the Spain. Has anyone done sero surveys of animals? They, no, that's, I believe it's ongoing. Yeah. Can we ask people, they say ongoing. Okay. Have you had any in, in Sweden or up here in Scandinavia? We have no. We have never have had any CCH cases. Mm. Ali, can I ask how is it with so if it's the ticks and then global warming, are these ticks spreading to new areas so that this is uh, something that we might expect to find in other countries in Europe down the road? I believe. I mean, again, I mean, what I can say that last year we find the adult hyaloma in Sweden. Usually they come by migratory birds, but that are nymph. So they need to have a very dry and uh, hot, uh, hot summer. Then they can get adult. But then it should follow it a few years after that, the same kind of the weather, before you can get the ticks established. And when you have the tick established, sooner or later you will have the virus. That's for sure. But, but for this, I will say in the North Europe, the possibility is low. But we see in the West, I mean, as we have it in Spain, and when we have the, usually we say when we have the human cases, this is, this is the top of our iceberg. So it means that the virus is really established in the nature. So to, so, and this is the only way for us to and see when we have the virus around us, when we find the patients. And then it's really too late to, 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 but there's lots of studies uh, uh, heading by the European CDC to just see how the ticks move around and so on. But we need, uh, you need to have a global warming really extremely and then the virus will move, yes. So it's, your, in your opinion, it's likely to move to other areas. I mean, I think the ticks are, are these ticks only in parts of the world where we find the virus at the moment? Yes, they are. And they are is, in a bit, I do, is, is the degree 50. So there is a line that uh, nice. the virus never, we don't find the ticks above that. But where we find the ticks, we find the virus. This is quite, they live symbiosis. Right. But as you said, with warming, the tick range is likely to increase. Yeah, yes. So so we should be ready for more cases, right? Yeah, I believe in, we need to have at least some kind of the monitoring of these ticks. Yes, yeah. And they are completely different because they ticks, there are lots of ticks around, mm -hmm. but these are they're completely different. We call them hunting uh, ticks. So they really run after you to catch you and bite you. And we was again in Turkey, just, we was in the field. I mean, during one hour, we could collect 100 ticks and they just find us. Took 15 minutes before we, we didn't see any ticks. 15 minutes later, they was all over the place. So they find you, they go for biting. Yeah. So they are really horrible uh, <laughs> ticks, I will say. So, sounds like an idea for the next zombie movie. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Make the zomb zombie ticks. <laughs> you cannot kill them. How do we? How do you diagnose the the infection at the moment in people? Um, this is 
more or less follow the um, Ebola or all other hemorrhagic fever. So it means that when you show the symptoms, you have lots of virus in your blood. So by doing the uh, traditional PCR, you easily can see that if you are, uh, have the virus or not. It do we need better, more rapid diagnostics, or is that enough? I believe, yeah, I mean, at the moment is enough, but but if you, again, if you go to Turkey, to these small villages and the small hospitals, so they wish to have this uh, quite rapid diagnostic assays. Otherwise, they have to send it to the reference laboratory, which is in Ankara, and they do the, and the same in others. Some, some other countries in the Europe, they cannot need to do the diagnostic by themselves. They have to send it some other place. So, so yes, I will say it's, it's good to have a rapid diagnostic. Mm -hmm. Is that something you work on in your life? We, we do also that one, okay. yes, sure. Okay. So the tick bites a human and delivers, it's taking blood and in the process, it's delivering virus, right? Exactly. So what, what happens next? Does the vi where does the virus go and what does it do? So I, and what we believe, again, this is quite uh, um, not very well studies, but we believe that the first step is infection of the macrophages mm -hmm. and follow up by the dendritic cells and they spread to the, to the spleen and then go to the uh, affecting the endothelial cells in the vessels. We see usually in the very severe cases, very, um, uh, how we call it, uh, 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 cytokine storms. So we see very high level of different uh, inflammatories, which affecting the junctions between the between the uh, endothelial cells, and that's lead to the leakage of the plasma. However, when we see when we go to these severe cases, we find virus almost in all organs of these patients, and especially the liver is highly affected, which because the, the blood is just going through that. So it's liver affected, but vessels affected, and even in some patient we see effect even in the brain. So through the blood barrier, um, so so they affecting and they spread the virus. So. So there's a viremia, clearly. Right? Yes. Do, is there any evidence that ticks can spread from person to person? That won't be done now, but definitely from animal to to patients. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, if you if you survive, can you get infected again? That's also I mean quite easy question to ask, but for us, we don't know. Uh, we don't know because again, these kind of there are not so many cases, uh, and to do the really research, you need to have this biosafety level four facility, which also make it complicated to do real basic science or animal experiment. And to do it, just looking to, to pay for the patients also critical because again, there are not so big outbreak, there are not so many outbreaks and the sample is highly qualified so you cannot send it around. So it's, it's limited because of several, uh, uh, several uh, steps that's if if you if you ask this from some what what other scientists they will say that they this is you should have done for twenty years ago forty years ago <laughs> but <laughs> we cannot do that I mean we are not stupid in this field but <laughs> but we are uh, is is very complicated yeah, yeah, sure very no complicated. if you need a BSL four it's hard right yes. so is there an animal model you could use. Actually, I would say there is now very good animal models in uh, non-human primates, in, uh, actually developed in NIH in, uh, in Hamilton's lab, which Matty visited for, I believe, half a year ago. In uh, Montana? Yeah. yeah. Montana. Hamilton, Montana, yeah. yeah. So we did, a, together with Ollie, a preventive vaccine study uh, there. Oh, this is a nice town, isn't it, Hamilton? Yeah, it's in the middle of nowhere. It is. <laughs> it is, yeah, truly. But it's, uh, no, it, it's uh, fantastic surroundings. And uh, it's really amazing how the NIH started out there almost 100 years ago. Uh, Willie Willy Bergdorfer yeah, with tick, it, tick-borne diseases, mm -hmm. right? That's where yeah, it started. It was, and it's called the Rocky Mountain uh, Laboratory. Yeah, yeah, because it was Rocky Mountain spotted fever yeah. that yeah. was mm -hmm. first found there. And they... I've been there a few times. It's a, mm. I like it. Yeah. If, if you fish, it's a good place. Oh yeah, to go. I did. I did some fly fishing. <laughs> I caught a, uh, a couple of uh, the what's called the cutthroat uh, uh, trout. Yeah, trout. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's very. I, I I don't fish, but my colleague Dixon de Pommier brought me fishing once, and it was really mm. quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, you, you're you've published some work on a vaccine. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, it, it, there is a vaccine, but you said it's very 
crudely produced and not very safe probably exactly there is a one vaccine developed in 70s by russia yeah and now is produced in bulgaria so that is really you they grow the virus in mice brain and they cry, uh, homogenize it and inactivate it and then use it so it is not really the best way uh, is, i believe if you have <laughs> if you have to choose, I will take the chance with the CCHF, not go for the vaccine. Because it's got brain material. Brain, my mice brain material, so it's not really... And they use it in just in Bulgaria, and this is the high-risk uh, yeah. uh, groups, which is soldiers. Okay. So your paper, you, you have uh, two, two different kinds of vaccine. One is a plasmid-based DNA. So why did you pick that? But we go, I mean, there are, there are several different approaches around now. I mean, it has been changed since we did this review. So, so there are actually virus, uh, uh, vector based. Yeah. Uh, several studies ongoing and there are, we choose the DNA virus because DNA concept because we're collaborating with Mati and Mati is the expert in DNA vaccine. So that was one approach. We also approach using the virus-like particles and also other virus vectors. The problem has been shown that when you go for the virus vectors, this glycoprotein of CCHF is one of the most difficult glycoprotein ever anyone worked with. So, so people tried to put it on the virus vectors couldn't really succeed and this has been done by the experts with this virus vector so 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 most people working with the virus vector really couldn't get any good candidate for um, for doing this one of the successful is they're using the mva which is based on the vaccinia ankara vaccinia that seems to be uh, seems to be successful but again there is problem with the glycoprotein so it seems that uh, DNA vaccines or other genomic uh, uh, aspects as RNA vaccines seems to be quite promising, I will say. So you found that this DNA-based vaccine, and you have multiple viral proteins on these plasmids. Yes, we have the glycoprotein and also nucleoprotein. Okay, and that induced protection. It used protection, not infection, but protection. So protection against disease, right? Protection against disease. But not. But the, this is a mouse model, right? We did the mice model, but now we have done the it non-human in the primate. non-human primate, and we see quite uh, pretty nice data. So this is being done in uh, Hamilton? Yeah. Yep. By Heinz Feldman. Heinz Feldman. And then um, it, doesn't prote- it doesn't prevent infection, but it prevents hemorrhagic fever. So I guess the non-human primates get hemorrhagic fever, right? They, uh, this model, they get uh, disease of CCHF. CCHF, okay. And um, so the, what is protecting them? Is it an antibody or a that's, cellular? That's what we are going to investigate. So this is quite, I mean, for, for, the, for the non-human, for the, for the mice model, we see that you need to have quite good T cell response, but you need also some antibodies. But for the, for the non-human primate, this is ongoing investigation. So we're doing, and it is, at the moment, we cannot say so much. And, and so in, in a non-human primate, can you deplete them of cells or antibodies to tell which one is protective? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you, can, you can do uh, in vivo depletion of uh, CD4, CD8s on the B cells, basically. Oh, so, good. So you could, uh, that you can do. Uh, and uh, we'll see what kind of data studies we will okay. when we have all the data. You, you also have a transcriptionally competent virus-like particle. Yes. And does this also confer protection? Uh, we use this virus-like particle seems to be not working on this mice model, but we also know that because these are interferon alpha receptor knockout mice. And for this VLP, people have shown that to have any good immune response, you need to have interferon response. So these mice really lack yeah, this. Yeah, 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 sure. so, so it didn't work, but, but we find that the um, mice develop quite nice neutralizing antibodies. So neutralizing antibody there, but we couldn't see any protection. So, so I will say that possibility still is there, uh, one to follow in the future, but, uh, but it seems that DNA and RNA, even RNA vaccines, seems to be quite successful. Okay. So wh- it sounds like the nucleic acid vaccines are going to yeah. get the most attention. So you think eventually you'll, you'll bring this to people in, in clinical trials? Is that the goal? Yes, we are, d- we are doing one uh, European supported project called CCHF vaccine supported by Commission. Start 2017 is Matt is also one of the uh, collaborated in this project. So the idea is that we will push this uh, 
nucleic acid concept, most probably DNA, to the clinical phase one, which will be done in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. So do you need to have uh, company support eventually for this? Well, I mean, uh, to take it further than phase one, yeah. maybe, uh, but I think this is kind of... Uh, the, the 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 commercialization of this of a CCHF vaccine is probably fairly limited. Yes. So I'd say that the most probable is that uh, either the EU, the NIH, or or uh, WHO, or other uh, government-based agencies would uh, take Push it further. Yeah. But of course, it's uh, if a company would pick it up, it's uh, I think it's probably good. Yeah, I mean to, to do the manufacturing and all that yeah. is companies have the expertise. So exactly, even if NIH were involved, they would probably have a contract. Yeah, I mean, the, the, of course, the, the the production of the plasmid or or whatever it would be, but in this case, the plasmid it has to be do by a GMP manufacturer. Yeah, right. which is commercial. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, good luck with that. Thank you. And it sounds like there is a medical need, and uh, it sounds like you're making good progress. So that would, that would be great. Nicholas, let's talk a little bit about uh, your work, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I learned a lot from reading uh, some of your papers. So let's, mm -hmm. let's start with chronic hepatitis C infection, its impact on the NK natural killer cell diversity of which I know very little, so I'm gonna ask you a lot of basic yep, questions. Yep. So what is a natural killer cell? So a natural killer cell is a, so it's an immune cell, so it belongs, it's a lymphocyte, uh, but it belongs to our innate immune system. And it was actually originally discovered here at the Karolinska back in 1975, um, at the same time as you as scientists discovered it was two papers at the, at the same time, but it's an immune cell, as you can hear from the name, that targets other cells for cytotoxicity. And so it's specialized in recognizing cancer cells to eliminate those, mm -hmm. as well as to respond against stressed cells, such as virus-infected cells, and to, to kill those. And being part of the innate immune system means that these cells are primed and ready to go. So they are early effector cells that respond rapidly to acute infections. Okay, so they don't have to do any rearrangement like B and T cells, no, right? No, no. And, so and they, how do they recognize, say, a virus-infected cell? So they would, so a virus-infected cell would signal that infection in many different ways. It would be an interferon response, uh, the cell would be stressed. If it's a DNA virus, you might have a sort of genotoxic stress to, to the cell and and the, the infected cell would, for instance, release uh, different cytokines and other factors that can stimulate the NK cell, or it would upregulate stress-induced receptors on its surface. And the NK cell constantly then scans its surroundings, and if it recognizes the stress signals, uh, it will react. Um, and a virus-infected cell might also be interested in avoiding T cell recognition, and one mechanism for that is to downregulate MHC class 1 right. so that right. it sort of becomes invisible for T cells. And then the NK cell can actually sense that loss of uh, MHC class 1. It's uh, a principle called the missing self hypothesis. Yeah, yep, I remember. Absence of self, right? Absence of Which self. Is, for a student, is hard to yeah. understand. And that was also <laughs> actually originally discovered here at the Karolinska back okay. in the 80s. So it's... So do are all virus infections involving NK cells or just some? I think you probably have a contribution of NK cells yeah. to, to many viral infections. But then I think also our immune system is redundant in the mm -hmm. sense that NK cells contribute and they do it different yeah. in different infections. Um, what has been shown is that if you lack viruses, different types of herpes viruses like varicella, uh, CMV and so if you lack NK cells, you you get severe herpes virus infections. So they seem to have a specific mm -hmm. role in, in these viruses. Okay. These infections. So I, I don't know if you know, you probably know this, but the poliovirus receptor is involved. So this is a virus yeah, 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 yeah. we discovered years ago. It turns out it's, what is it, an NK recognition? It's an NK recognition receptor, receptor. which someone else discovered. Yeah. 
PVR. So PVR we, CD 155. Yeah, so we have been studying <laughs> PVR a lot. And, yeah, uh, it's very funny because I always tell the students the receptors are there not for the virus but for other reasons, and we didn't know what PVR was doing, but that's very interesting. So do you know uh, th that NKs are important for hep C infections? So they are important in the sort of early response during mm -hmm. acute hep C. Uh, there was a science paper from Salim Kako published back in 2004 where they looked at immunogenetics of a receptor family that is tightly linked to NK cells and they could see that if you have certain versions of these receptors you were much more likely to clear acute infection or respond to treatment and, and clear the infection. Okay. So in this paper you talk about the the imprint of the virus on the NK cells. And I, I wonder if you could explain what you, what you mean by an imprint, how you measure it. Yeah. So what we are doing is that we are using chronic hepatitis C as, as a model for a sort of chronic infectious insult on our immune system. And we know that chronic viral infections like hep C or HIV or LCNV and so on have a negative effect on the immune system causing exhaustion of the immune system for instance of you have you get exhausted t-cells um, but then with hep c we have this sort of revolution that ha has happened over the last five ten years with uh, new direct acting antivirals where you then very rapidly can eliminate the virus mm -hmm. so then we have a human model where we can ask so this imprint of exhaustion that we can look see on the immune system. So when we have an affected immune system, if we then rapidly remove the virus, will the immune system recover? Right. And we will, so, will we sort of get back to full immunological health? Or is it so that these individuals that previously then had a chronic infection, will they sort of suffer from an affected immune system many, many years after that virus was eliminated? And that is something we look at then with NK cells, where we found a new way to uh, measure diversity within our NK cell population. Typically you talk about diversity when you talk about T cells and, and B cells and the T cell receptor and, and antibodies, but we also know uh, now since some years that also your NK cells are diverse and they can adopt to different environmental challenges like infections. And we found a new way to measure that diversity. We could see that it was affected by uh, chronic hepatitis C infection, something that these patients have had for many years then. Mm -hmm. And then when we rapidly eliminated the virus, so when these patients were treated and we followed them up, uh, I think two and a half years after the virus was removed, we could still see that this sort of reduced diversity within the NK cell compartment was mm -hmm. present. So it seemed like at least the NK cells were not becoming reinvigorated and coming back to sort of full health, if you call it like that. So, from what I understand, you're measuring it's some kind of flow cytometry or related yeah, assay, yeah. right? Um, is it the one where you use isotopes to measure many different parameters, or is it standard cell flow cytometry? Yeah, so it's not cytop, but it's it's standard. But okay. we can push that up to. Uh, 29 colors now, so we do. <laughs> so it's uh, in the same ballpark as, as Cytos. When I was a student, it was one color. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So you can measure the diversity, but does that, does that tell you about the function of the NK cells? Does it? Yeah, we also looked at function, and, mm -hmm. uh, and we could see some effects on function as well. And we look at, so NK cells, they perform natural cytotoxicity, which is then the, you know, this. Okay capacity to recognize target cells. Uh, NK cells express FC receptors, so they can respond via antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Uh, so it's they have CD16 on their surface, okay. and, and, and then they potently respond to TH1 cytokines, such as IL-12, IL-15, IL-18 okay. type 1 interferon. So the, the changes you see in the diversity correlate with functional yeah, alteration. Yeah, we also saw right? functional. So you think they're a good measure of function? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so we get that question a lot from reviewers. I never reviewed uh, any of your papers. No. <laughs> <laughs> In a recent sort of uh, 
paper we published on dengue virus, they, they wanted us to sort of use dengue infected cells as, as a target. And I think that we have golden standard ways to look at how NK cells function that are very standardized uh, across laboratories and they serve one purpose we have but then i think and that should be there but then we should also work towards finding ways to assess function that is also relevant for the context that you're studying yeah, yeah. Um, with hep c that's obviously challenging so you need perhaps primary hepatocytes and finding ways to infect those and and then ideally you would want nk cells from the same individual and so it has uh, tons of caveats to it. Yeah, but. okay. So this um, alteration in NK only happens with chronic hep C, right? In acute, you don't see that? That's a good question. It has not really been studied that much. We are doing one study now in, in close collaboration with uh, researchers in both in uh, at Hanover Medical School and in uh, Essen in Germany, where we have generated a lot of data from... Uh, so it was a German multi-center treatment trial where they then treated patients with acute hep C across, I think, 20 different sites. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and our collaborators could collect blood samples and we have been analyzing them here together with the collaborators. And we have all the data on the computer, but no, no sort of results yet. It hasn't yeah. been analyzed. Right. Okay. Uh, so what, what is, how is the virus infection doing this? How is it altering the profile of the NK cells? Do you have ideas about that? Yeah, that's also a good question. So um, I guess the short answer is that we don't really know, but uh, first of all, you have the virus by itself that can, uh, for instance, bind to CD81, which is then expressed on the surface of NK cells. So it's a tetraspanin that hep C can bind to. Uh, and people have previously shown that that will lead to alterations in your NK cells. Uh, so possibly then that you have a chronic stimulation via that receptor pathway over many years will have an effect. Um, possibly you, you will also, I mean, have immune cells that then exist in a low-grade chronic inflammatory microenvironment in the liver uh, that then also possibly over many years will have this effect. Yeah. So all of this is happening in the liver pretty much, right? The NKs are there and that's where all the infe virus infection is going yeah. on, right? It's not peripheral tissues at all. No, so it's, uh, yeah, hep C is a very hepatotropic right. virus. Do you think, so how long does it take for this imprint to occur? Do you have any ideas? Does it take a month or six months or longer? Have you been able? To no, we haven't been able to study that. So It would be, it would be interesting, right? Yeah, it would be interesting, but... I guess to sort of raise those cohorts, uh, so you don't have really good model systems to study hep C, yeah. so then you would have, you know, prospective samplings of risk individuals. And also now with the new uh, drugs that are available, from a clinical point of view, as, as long as we can supply and reach out to patients with these drugs, we will sort of have a way to tackle the problem yeah. with hep C. Yeah. But we will instead end up having a lot of patients that, that have had this infection and perhaps then we'll have a, who knows, maybe a lifelong imprint in how their immune system is not functioning as, as it should. And that. So that's another question. Do you think it would be a lifelong imprint or you've looked for like two and a half years, I think, yeah. right? Um, are you going to look longer to see? We are looking longer. Uh, other people have also been studying this uh, looking at T cells, for instance, and they also see that you see some sort of partial reinvigoration occurring. We have looked at another cell type, uh, mate cells, a type of mm -hmm. innate like T cell, uh, and we see a similar imprint that is also very long lasting. And, and even if you do a you know, simple experiment just to look at your, all your serum cytokines, right. um, and if you have chronic hep C, you will find quite a lot of alterations compared to in healthy individuals. And, and most of those are also persisting over time, despite the fact that liver inflammation uh, sort of veins quite rapidly after removal of virus. And you will also have a regress in, in, uh, in your liver disease. But, uh, so these, these studies of NKs are done on peripheral blood? Mostly peripheral blood. Right. 
so the, the NK cells are in the circulation, obviously, and you can, yeah. I mean, that's a, re, as far as you can tell, that's a reflection of what's going on in the liver, right? It's a reflection. That, I mean, the, the, they also pass, constantly passing by the liver. Yeah. And, um, okay. and you have certain other types of NK cells that perhaps more permanently sit in the liver, and we would love to find ways to also study those in hep C, but we take fewer and fewer liver biopsies in the clinic, and uh, <laughs> yeah. it's not ethically sound really to, to right. do that on patients yeah, nowadays. So s assuming it lasts, this imprint of, on NKs lasts a long time, do you think this has implications for other infections that the patients might get? So I think both infections and cancer risk, Cancers, yeah. possibly, and especially, you know, maybe not when you are in your 40s, 50s, 60s, but maybe, so if we have this sort of immune redundancy uh, when you are sort of yeah. young up to middle age, when you become older, uh, maybe this redundancy becomes less efficient. And you might end up having, you know, selective gaps in your immunity, and that will increase your risk of, yeah. you know, getting um, reactivations from different viruses belonging to the herpes virus group, or it will it might increase your yeah. cancer risk. Yeah. So it will be interesting to follow these patients who have been cured, right, and see. Yep. What happens? And here in Sweden, you can do that easily because you have everyone's number, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's harder to do elsewhere. Do yeah. you have a, a good number of, of hep C patients in Sweden? We have, uh, I don't know, maybe. Four, it used to be around 40,000. Yeah. I think maybe they've uh, treated away five, 10,000. But still, the, surprisingly, the infection rate is quite similar to the treatment rate, so it, it should be fairly stable. It's around two, 3,000 new infections every year, and there's around, I think now it's increased up to two or 3,000 treatments every year, or? Yeah, something yeah. like that. So, I, so it's, it's kind of, we need to be better at treatment uh, to reduce the number. And these are intravenous drug use infections? Uh, mainly, mainly. Uh, that's, that's the big part. Okay. Mm. And the yeah, prison population. Uh, yeah. Uh, still, with hep C, it's this magic around 25% that you don't know how they got infected. But, uh, I mean, it it's, could be sexual infection. It mm -hmm. could be someone who doesn't admit that they actually are using drugs yeah. or something. I mean, yeah. Or ways that we haven't discovered yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All right. So, there's another study I want to talk a little bit about, and that involves hepatitis B. Yeah infection where you again you look at nk cells mm -hmm. but here it's this is, this is something i didn't realize that in a certain fraction of chronically infected hep b patients where they're getting nucleoside analog antiviral therapy you can actually stop mm -hmm. and they get clear can you explain this to us yeah <laughs> so this is uh, actually quite exciting so for hep b we have had effective therapy for, for a long time now with the nucleoside nucleotide analogs that then suppresses the virus, it reduces the risk, your liver inflammation and your risk for cancer. But uh, you don't clear the infection with these drugs. Right. So for most patients, this is a lifelong treatment. Uh, the drugs have very few side effects, so or basically no side effects. But I think it's calculated that on average you need to be treated for 70 years to clear chronic hepatitis 70, B. 70, 70, 70, 70, 70. And mm. the golden standard measure then for clearing is uh, HBS antigen zero conversion, so to develop anti-HBS antibodies. Uh, and that takes on average 70 years. Uh, but then you can imagine in countries where you have uh, sort of uh, insurance companies that finance the healthcare system and so on, that you will have a pressure from those that we don't really want to go on and and paying for this treatment for the rest of your life. So, especially in certain countries in Asia, it's been a pressure to find ways to, to get around this. Right. So they started with, they had patients that were uh, HPE antigen negative that had been on these drugs for um, a couple of years, and then they started to take the patients off treatment. Uh, you and said HPE antigen. HPE antigen negative. So what does that mean as opposed to HBS? Uh, so these are different uh, 
maybe matte can uh... oh, the e antigen the e antigen uh, the uh, from the, when hpv infects a cell uh, one of the escape mechanisms that it ha- or the way for the virus to persist is that it overexpresses the surface antigen and secretes that so that you can use in diagnostic. And the purpose of doing that, presumably, is twofold. It's to block neutralizing antibodies, but also to screw up the T cell response to S. In addition, you have another protein which is related to the capsid protein that's called the E antigen. And it's uh, basically an in-frame version with core antigen, but it it contains a small secretory sequence and it's truncated. So instead of being 180 amino acid, it's around 150 and it's secreted. And the concept of E was actually discovered now talking about Swedish discoveries. It was discovered in the 70s by Lars Magnus and uh, here here in Sweden. And uh, it was early realized that uh, if you had E antigen in the serum, you were infectious. And uh, so that was the dogma for quite a while that you were highly infectious when you had the secreted E antigen. Now we know that there are versions of the virus where you actually have uh, a stop codone. So you can still be infectious even though you don't have the E antigen. But traditionally E antigen was used as a marker for immune control that if you lose E antigen and you start producing anti-E, that's a sign of a better... uh, Okay, so you said in those patients they considered withdrawing the drug, right? Yeah, but also then having immune control also means having an activated immune system and and those are the patients that might get liver damage from that activated immune system, so those are the patients that you primarily would treat. Mm. Uh, But then, yeah, so they were starting to do this... um, not really planned studies, but more observational treatment cessations in, 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 in these countries. And uh, what they saw from those, or what they observed from those, was that if you take hepatitis B patient off treatment, the virus will rebound and come back. Mm-hmm. You will get, in many cases, a sort of small flare with liver enzymes going up. But then they saw that up to maybe a third of all individuals that they took off treatment would, within a year or two, uh, zero convert and clear the infection and this was observational Uh, it's now been followed up in a randomized trial that was performed here in in germany where they then could see that somewhere between 20 and 30 percent if you take them off treatment they would get the virus back they would get the flare what then they will within a year or two or three uh, clear the virus Um, so that then made isel which is the European Association for the Study of Liver Diseases actually introduced this into their uh, treatment guidelines for chronic Hep B. That if you are E antigen negative, you have been on stable uh, treatment for a number of years, and you don't have um, end stage liver disease or liver cirrhosis, then this is actually something that you could potentially mm. consider doing. Uh, we were then wondering in some of the studies we have been doing, and this is also in collaboration with Hanover Medical School in in Germany. So what is actually happening with these patients that get their virus back, but then go on and manage to clear the infection? Uh, So uh, we did a study with 16 patients that we took off treatment, and then we followed these patients very carefully over time. And our hypothesis going into this was that we would see... uh, an immune response to the virus coming back Mm -hmm. and then that this immune response possibly would contribute to uh, clearing the infection or to the zero conversion that we observed. And that was the case both for NK cells and uh, uh, HPV-specific T cells that we went from uh, having no response or very few of these HPV-specific T cells when the chronic hepatitis B infected patients were on treatment, when you took off, when you removed treatment and the virus came back, the T cells responded with expansion, the NK mm-hmm. cells responded becoming more activated and more functional. Um, and the patients that in our trial then went on to clear hepatitis B, those were the ones that had the sort of highest magnitude of the response. Mm. Uh, and so what we're thinking now is that so it was still only 
uh, a subgroup of patients that went on to clear, but maybe you can actually do repeated treatment interruptions in these patients mm. and that with every treatment interruption you would uh, somehow increase your uh, immune system's capacity to respond to hepatitis B and then all of a sudden you end up above a certain threshold and that will lead to mm -hmm. conversion and a sort of functional cure. Um, so that's an idea that we might be able to pursue. Now, have you, have, have you looked at NK cells the way you did with hep C in these patients in terms of an imprint? Uh, partly, yes. And we saw similar signs that we had an imprint. By the, um, by in the chronically infected patients. Yeah. So now if you withdraw the drug, is the, the imprint remains, right? Or does it go, does it uh, change? We didn't look specifically at that, but what we saw, though, and what was, I mean, because hepatitis B is, fr from an immune point of view, often referred to as a stealth virus, that you, mm. it doesn't really provoke an innate immune response. So we were quite surprised that we actually could see that when you took these patients off treatment, um, including then the NK cells. And this appeared to be, we didn't really see signs of a type 1 interferon response, so it was probably something else that was. So, so in the T cells, you mentioned earlier, they become exhausted for hep C, in hep C patients, yeah. right? So that means they're no longer responding, they're no longer attacking infected cells, which has to do with checkpoint regulation, yeah. right? PD-1 and so forth. Yeah, yeah. And so I think you mentioned that you could people have used uh, checkpoint inhibitors to get around that, right? To treat hepatitis virus infected mm, patients? Not, I'm not sure if it's been done in the clinic, so you can experimentally... Uh, maybe it's in, in cells. Yeah. yeah, in the lab see that um, also in HEPI, your HEPI-specific uh, T cells will express high levels of PD-1 and and you can then increase the function of those cells if you if you yeah, give anti PD one yeah. antibodies or anti PD L one antibodies. Uh, on the other hand, these drugs as they are used now in the clinic come with a lot of side effects. I see. Um, okay. So that so that's probably not going to be a treatment modality. No, and it's also not everything is also not about PD one. You also have a larger program of exhaustion with you know the metabolism of the cells are affected and so on. So there's also CTLA involved, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I don't understand why <laughs> if you take away the drug, the T cells recover. So with the drug present, uh, I guess viral proteins are constantly being made and the T cells are recognizing infected cells and getting exhausted because of that. That's the idea. Pro probably when uh, before you start treating the patients, when you have a viremia, right. that's probably when you have, you know, the constant exposure and you would end up having exhausted immune cells. Mm -hmm. People have shown that if you compare patients with hep B with viremia to hep B patients that have been on treatment for, for a long time, then just suppressing the virus partly recovers your T cell compartment, for instance. So, and, but maybe it's also that the viral rebound that you, that, that is observed following treatment cessation is different in how it triggers the immune response compared to an acute infection. Mm. So maybe it's different signaling pathways that are engaged and this would then give you a different type of uh, T-cell response uh, that then might lead to, to sort of these patients clearing the infection. Mm. So you think this may eventually be... Um, so it's already approved for a certain, as you said, certain... So it's, it's in, the, in the guidelines. Um, so we will see. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a lot of other development going on in the happy field with new drugs yeah. that are in in sort of late uh, phase clinical trials and also vaccine efforts and, um, mm -hmm. and so on. Okay. In fact, that's what we're going to talk with you about in a moment. Um, so uh, you're continuing, I presume, both hep C and hep B yes. studies yeah. Yeah. focusing on these issues, right? Yeah. And we're also doing more uh, HEP Delta work also. Mm -hmm. 
So that's from a clinical point of view now the most troublesome cohort of hepatitis virus infected patients where you have very few treatment options and they progress much more rapidly to end state liver disease and many times you you can't offer anything to the patients and they end up having a liver transplant. So maybe that's a good point to go to you now because I read this paper. Yeah. Uh, blocking entry of Hep B and D as an immunotherapy for inf I guess it's in press, right? Oh no, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, submitted. So oh, so uh, I got a I got a I got a special. Oh yeah, you got the preview. You sent it. that to to Anya's to me, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's uh, hopefully it's going to be public. So it's okay if we talk about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure, no problem. I don't want to do anything wrong. No, no, no. It's it's. Uh, so it's fine. What's the effect of Delta on on the Hep B as as uh, he was just mentioning? Well, the problem with Delta is that it, if you look at uh, a chronic HPV infection, you would look at uh, maybe in uh, over a 10 to 20 year period, maybe 20%, up to 30% would develop severe liver disease, maybe over a 30 year period. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Delta, you would have 60% developing severe liver disease over a 10 year period. So it, it really speeds up the process. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think we really know why it does it, but it's, uh, it, the Delta virus is sort of a satellite virus to HPV. It, it's an, a negative stranded circular RNA genome. It replicates using uh, human RNA polymerases that use, ba basically it, would, uh, it thinks it's a DNA template or negative DNA. So it, it uses the uh, RNA, host RNA polymerase. One reason why it's hard to target antivirals because that would target the host. Uh, and then when it leaves, it actually uh, steals the surface envelope from HPV. So it's, it's a hybrid between Delta and HPV. So these patients who have accelerated disease, mm -hmm. when they first acquire HBV, does Delta coming then or do they get Delta later? Oh, you can actually do it, uh, in, or do it. You can actually get it in two different ways. You can either have it as a co-infection. That means that you get both infections at the same time. Right. And normally then you would actually clear the Delta infection. Uh, but if you have chronic HPV and you get Delta as a super infection, then that's the one who develops the chronic Delta infection. How do you get a super infection of Delta alone? Or would it be with oh, both well, Hep B and Delta? Yeah, well, I mean, the person you would get it from. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, uh, Delta was discovered in Italy by uh, Mario Rossetto uh, back in the, was it the late 70s or early 80s. Uh, and uh, mainly it's seen am among drug users. So if, if you go, uh, if you're an international drug user, uh, for example, I mean, you, you, and you have already contracted yeah. HPV, yeah. and you go and have a social event with other uh, drug users, right. which are double infected, then you get both HPV and Delta, but the one that sticks with you is the Delta, really, super infection. Okay. So I, this is all very interesting um, because uh, you probably know recently Delta sequences have been found in birds and snakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but exactly. there's no there's no hepatitis viruses in there, raising the as question. As far as we know, as far as we know, there mm -hmm. could be yeah. raising the question of whether other viruses could exactly. I mean, it could, it could it, it, it? That's kind of the idea now that actually Delta could steal other yeah. viral envelopes. And so that's been published now by another group showing yeah. that I think Hep C can package uh, Delta, Delta. Uh, Dengue, West Nile, mm. even VSV. Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, I don't think we really know how mon many people are mono-infected. Right, Delta. with Delta, Hello. yes, that's I a mean, good question. Because it doesn't mean that uh, you could still acquire a Delta infection, having it replicate, and then once you get another infection, you, it's, so I don't, um, yeah. So it's, and, and uh, Delta, is, it's, it's been a mystery for a long time how it, uh, how it behaves and why it does what it does, but I think there's a lot to learn. So the, is anyone looking at mono infections? 
Uh, I, I think they've done it experimentally uh, in uh, mice, yeah, mice that have humanized yeah. Yeah. Uh, livers. Uh, so, uh, but I'm, it, it's kind of hard because you would, it, it, as Nicholas said, you would require probably a liver biopsy, or you would look for delta RNA in a uh, in blood in uh, blood donors, for example, or ant antibodies. Yeah, or delta antibodies. Yeah, and you have to also look for Hep B at the same time to make sure it's not double. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that, mm -hmm. that's the interesting question. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see Delta alone? And then... I, I don't know. Do you know? I, 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 think I, we never, I think we don't look in the clinics. Yeah, but, exactly. But, I mean, we have diagnostic tests for Delta, mm -hmm. and all of those have then been at least evaluated on a lot of presumably negative individuals yeah. as the negative controls and mm. and they are they have very high specificity and sensitivity for the infected yeah. patients mm. it haven't been picked up in those yeah. but, uh, which doesn't exclude that they are but mm -hmm. okay now in this paper mm -hmm. the goal is to induce antibodies to s pre s1 yes exactly and one of the problems is, as you said earlier, there's so much um, S antigen produced, it's sopping up any antibody yes. that is made. And you, so your strategy is to link the, the gene to delta antigen. Yeah, we're using, because if, if you look globally, around 15 million are co we have 300 million carriers of HPV, and around 15 million are co-infected by delta. delta. But if you flip that around, you can actually say that uh, more than 90% do not have delta of those who are, uh, have HPV. So uh, if you then, then in a patient with chronic HPV, if your delta antigen would be like polio or anything else, it's, it's like a heterologous antigen. Right. Right. And in HPV, uh, the T cells are highly dysfunctional. They, if you take uh, any... HBV antigen and try to vaccinate, it's going to be very hard to activate the HBV specific uh, T cells. Mm -hmm. So if we then take the Delta antigen, which is really a foreign antigen for anyone not infected by Delta, right. and link that to the Pre-S and the, uh, the Pre-S1. And the reason for choosing Pre-S1 is that if you look at the excess viral particle or the junk viral particles mm -hmm. that are released by the liver, they mainly contain the small s, which lacks pre-S1. But the virus particles mainly contains pre-S1. So it would be a way to actually target the virus particle. So by making this, if I can say it, brilliant design, uh, <laughs> we're actually uh, we're circumventing the immune dysfunction and trying to really target the virus. And uh, since the, the antivirals that Niklas mentioned, they are, what they do is block the RT function of HPV, which is when HPV inf has infected a cell, the, vi the, the, uh, uh, the double-stranded DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then packaged into capsids, and there the RNA is converted to the HPV DNA. So that step is blocked, but that's the maturation step. So what we want to do is to block the entry step. And that's been very successful, for example, in HIV, when you have combination therapies that block both maturation or release of the virus and entry. So the idea, I mean, you could combine this with the standardized or the interruption techniques that Niklas is talking about. Uh, let's say you raise high levels of anti pre -S1, and then you do, for example, the, uh, or you just combine the trying to raise high levels of neutralizing antibodies uh, while they are on antivirals. And hopefully then you can stop the antiviral. So uh, why does linking uh, the pre -S to Delta overcome the T cell? problem. Yeah, because then uh, the pre-S1 is fairly small, so it, it does induce uh, HPV-specific T cells also, uh, uh, and the neutralizing antibodies. But the, uh, in a patient with chronic HPV that hasn't had Delta, the Delta-specific T cells, they're fine. It, I mean, it's like any other irrelevant antigen. So if you immunize 
a patient with chronic HPV with this uh, delta PS1 fusion, uh, the T cells that will drive the antibody response, they are healthy. They're not dysfunctional HPV specific, but they are healthy T cells that then can boost a very high or promote a high antibody and hopefully also PS specific T cell response. Okay. So that, that's kind of the that's idea. That's the idea. So how did you test this and, and what happened? Oh, we, we've tested it. Uh, we first of all we screened it in regular mice just to see which of different constructs that were the best. You have made DNA plasmids and immunized. Yeah, we, yeah, mice, we did, right? we, we've done it both as a, a DNA uh, vaccine. We've done it as a flavi-based viral vector. We've done it as a E. coli-produced protein, which is of course the simplest way of doing it. Uh, and we've combined these, so we had a DNA prime and a protein boost, which seems to be extremely good. Mm. But anyway, so we, we looked basically at antibody levels in mice. Right. And then we took those, sent to uh, Stefan Urban in Heidelberg, who right. tested those for in vitro neutralization of HPV. And those that gave the best neutralizing responses, those when we started immunizing rabbits to see that we can get in a larger animal, get good antibodies. So, uh, and then uh, we sent those antibodies to uh, Philip Müllemann in Ghent, who has the uh, humanized mouse model where he can infect with HPV. And we saw that also these mice could be potentially protected by these mm -hmm. antibodies. Again, uh, the weak point is it's not treating a chronic infection, it's really preventing, but it, it, for us it proves the point that it blocks entry of the virus. Right. So, do, do you have to test it in a chronic infection model? Or maybe, maybe yeah, there isn't what, one, What right? we'll do, we'll, we'll uh, tr raise antibodies in different transgenics. I mean, right. we have the E antigen, core antigen, S antigen transgenics to see that it really circumvents the bypasses the tolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you have different, uh, you have an AAV model that can, that Ulrike Pretzer has that can, uh, where you infect uh, the mice using AAV, but it carries the HPV genome. So you get a chronic replication in these mice. Uh, again, it's not based on the reinfection. It's really just a, a chronic production of virus, but right. that theoretically you could uh, use. Okay. Uh, also, what you can do is to have the humanized mice uh, chronically infected and then uh, transfer either T cells or you transfer the antibodies after you have the uh, established infection. Okay. And so the, the humanized mice have pieces of human liver. Oh, yeah, well, well, the way you do it is basically uh, there's different types of models, but they, the first thing is that they are, they stop producing the mouse liver. You can do that by induction, by a transgene or a different way. So they lack their own liver. Mm -hmm. To rescue them, you in inject human hepatocytes and the human hepatocytes will repopulate. Right. It won't grow to the size of a human liver, but <laughs> of a mouse liver. Uh, and uh, they're, of course, they're highly immune deficient to accept the human graft. Uh, so you can't really immunize these mice, but what you can do is different adoptive transfer experiments. Very nice. And so um, there, are, you mentioned in the paper there also have been some other ways tested to block entry. Yeah. Like one of them is, is a peptide, right? Yeah, exactly. It's called the Myrclodex, and that's actually on its way to being uh, uh, an approved therapy. It's in phase three clinical trials. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a small pre S peptides that, that you inject into the patient uh, subcutaneously. And what it does is really to uh, competi uh, competitively uh, inhibit virus binding to the NTCP receptor. So, uh, and th I think that's probably going to be approved for Delta virus. It, it does have some effect. I saw an urban report that in Rotterdam, I yeah. think he mm -hmm. talked about that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, uh, they've done fantastic work with that. And that's different from your approach. You want to make antibodies 
Yeah, exactly. Where, where uh, the, the, if, if you look at possible advantages and disadvantages, the disadvantage with the Mucludex, although it's very effective, is that you have to constantly administer it. Right. And so far, I don't think they've solved the, you want to have it as an oral administration rather than an injectable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, if you can raise good anti prius one antibodies, uh, that does the same thing, but it, it actually targets the virus. You also, because the, the anti-CP receptor normally uh, handles bile salts, so you can actually get a, a, a disbalance in the, in the transport of bile salts. Uh, and that, uh, it, that's one of the known side effects of the Mucludex. And you would completely avoid that sure. with racing anti pres one because it only targets the virus. And of course, you only need a few immunizations as opposed to well, a, yeah. constantly, yeah, right? Exactly. It, but you would, the host would produce the pharmaceutical itself. So the, the Mirkludex is kind of like the peptide HIV inhibitors we have yeah, to inject the, the over and over. T3 or T4 it was called. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's similar. Yeah, the, the fusion inhibitor. But right. the, this right. is really a competitive Blocking inhibitor. Blocker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so do you have any sense for which form will eventually make it to people? Because you said you have DNA based, you have vectored approaches. Uh, in this case, I think um, uh, I, the, 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 so far, the one that we see the, if you want to raise both strong T cell and antibody response, then DNA has the advantage that it, it's a good T cell immunogen. Yeah. However, the antibody responses may not be as good. So what we've done is DNA prime and then give repetitive protein boosts. And that looks like the best. The disadvantage is that when you're doing GMP production, you have to do both an E. coli protein and a DNA, so it's going to make it more expensive. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, if, if I would be asked today, which one would you pick? I'd, maybe the protein one, mm -hmm. because it, it does race. Uh, and we haven't tested, we've tested it with Allen, because that's the approved adjuvant of today. But if you take the other ones, MF50 mine or a QS21, maybe that would even further improve the efficacy. Yeah. And as you said, Mircludex is probably going to be approved, but so it's always good to have more than one approach, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and the Mircludex so far hasn't shown, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but not uh, as far as I know, hasn't had a strong effect on HBV, but it has on Delta. Mm -hmm. You see really drops in the Delta replication, and you don't see that much effect on HBV. So it's, it's mainly a Delta drug for, with our vaccine, what we do is treat HBV, but we also protect them against Delta because then they'll have Delta-specific T cells right. and Delta-specific PS1 antibodies. So it's, it's really a, a protective vaccine for those, again, for those with HBV to not get Delta also. Right, right. So you, you've mentioned there were some exciting new therapies, and so these are some of them that you were That's talking about. That's part of them, but it's also new uh, nucleoside, nucleotide analogs yeah. that mm -hmm. are being developed. And, and also capsid assembly inhibitors, yeah. which are, uh, again, they're, they're targeting the maturation step, but that's something that's in the clinic now, and that it does have an effect on the uh, viral replication. Are those uh, Adam Zlotnick's... Uh, Inhibitors? Yeah, I think he's been involved in one of those. I think that the J and J has one. Uh, there's a, a couple of different companies who are pursuing that, and they, I think they're called CAPS, Capsid Assembly Modifiers, or something. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We we talked with him a couple of years ago about those. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Now, the thing you really want to target with HBV is the. Uh, the C, what's called the CCC DNA, right. which is the, the HBV chromosome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you said that you might cure, well, functional cure functional, is the, yeah, uh, functional cure. The, but so, and the hope is to cure, but then you need to eradicate all infected cells. But if you can get rid of the CCC DNA, that's mm -hmm. sort of the key. And hopefully you can, if you can prevent reinfection at the same time as you 
block release. Right, right. You have a quick, quicker, you don't have the same replenishment. Of, sure. Yeah, because you're, you're going to block infection of new cells. Yes, exactly. Eventually, the infected cells will turn over. And may right. be killed by the immune response or... Right. Yeah. So eventually they'll be gone. But if you don't block new entry, that will never happen. Yeah. yeah. Great. That's very interesting. All right. That's a good uh, first TWIV out of three. And this is one of three TWIVs we're doing in Sweden. Oh. So that's a good first one. You can find TWIV at uh, any podcast player, microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you listen on your phone or tablet, please subscribe so you get every episode. And we know how many people are listening. That really helps us. And if you have questions or comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. Uh, my guests today, all from the Karolinska, Karolinska Institute. I shouldn't have any trouble pronouncing that. You know, that's a, a worldwide name, Karolinska Institute. Wh who, what is it named after, by the way, Karolinska? I think it's the Karolins, which were the soldiers for Charles XII uh, in the, back in the 17th, 18th century. And uh, the uh, Karolinska was actually started uh, because of they needed surgeons to uh, save the soldiers. Got it. That's a good name. All right. My guests today have been Ali Mirazimi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck with uh, CCHV and BSL-4. You work in a BSL-4 yourself? Yes. You go in uh, yeah, yourself? Yeah, I still do that, yes. You like to do yeah. that? Put the suit on. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have someone in with you all the yes, time. Yes, always. Yes, you need to be several people around. Yeah. Thanks so much. Nicholas Bjorkstrom, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good luck with uh, exhaustion mm -hmm. and other things. And Mati Sal Salber. Yeah, that's good <laughs> enough. Thank you yeah. so much for thank joining you. me today. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Agnes Bolin Wiener for arranging. I know I didn't pronounce your name right, but thank you so much for uh, arranging today's TWIV. Uh, she picked everyone, uh, so you can thank her for doing that. And uh, I took her word for it, um, And but it's been great. I really appreciate it. And this afternoon, we'll have another TWIV at the uh, other campus. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.